Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Me Metropolitan State of Texas event. Thanks for joining us uh, for today's program. Um, I'm Stephen Pedigo, faculty uh, at the LBJ School and director of the LBJ Urban Lab. For the past year, we uh, at the LBJ School, the Kinder Institute, for, uh, Kinder Institute for Research at Rice University, and the George W. Bush SMU Growth Institute have engaged leaders across the state to craft the metropolitan blueprint for our state. Today, we're gonna to explore some of those recommendations and insights from the report. Um, you can find a copy of that uh, blueprint on our institution's websites. Uh, we only have an hour and a half today and we've got a lot of content planned. We've got four rapid sessions, uh, why a Texas blueprint, advancing economic prosperity and building a more affordable Texas and closing the digital divide. So four great sessions. We are gonna ask that if you've got questions for today that you'll put them in the chat. We promise to follow up with those questions with a post event Q&A that we'll share via our social media channels. So do include your comment and your questions in the chat. But first, before we kick off today's program, let's start with a wonderful welcome um, from UT President Jay Hartzell. I deeply appreciate and respect this event's goals. It's great to see over 50 of the state's leading practitioners, policymakers, and business leaders from every part of the state and across the political spectrum come together with the shared goal of serving Texans. From my window here in the University of Texas at Austin Tower, I can count 27 cranes. The Lone Star State is booming. Of the nation's 15 fastest growing cities, six are in Texas, but with exceptional growth comes exceptional challenges. New strains on aging infrastructure, rising home costs, congestion, pollution, income inequality, and other impacts on the quality of life. That's why here at UT, through the work of the LBJ Urban Lab and others, we're leading the way in crafting policy that can create a more resilient, prosperous, and connected Texas. Our school motto is what starts here changes the world. And we believe this is true when it comes to urban planning as well. Because of our state's business climate, our First Amendment freedoms, and our can-do attitude, Texas cities can be a policy laboratory that leads the way globally. That's why the Texas Metropolitan Blueprint is such an exciting initiative. I congratulate the LBJ Urban Lab here at UT, the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University in Houston, and the George W. Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative in Dallas, for publishing this far-reaching and innovative policy agenda. It represents an unprecedented collaboration and it addresses the most pressing issues facing our state's urban areas, offering a way forward for Texas. Today, you'll have the pleasure of discussing that blueprint of grappling with its ideas and debating its implications. In doing so, you're contributing to a vital conversation that our state needs to have right now. So enjoy the day which begins with our first session, Why a Texas Metro Blueprint, moderated by William Fulton, director of the Kinder Institute. Over to you, Bill. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I wanna uh, welcome you to the first panel, Why a Metropolitan Blueprint. We, uh, this panel includes two, dis two of the most distinguished Texans I know, at least in the arena of public policy. <clears throat> that is former Education Secretary, Margaret Spellings, joining us from Dallas. Thank you, Margaret. And um, a former HUD Secretary and San Antonio Mayor, Henry Cisneros, uh, joining us from San Antonio. Thank you both for being here. Uh, let me just pose a first question by asking, and I'll go to you, Henry, first, and then Margaret will go to you. Um, uh, uh, Texas has 30 million people. It is the fastest growing large state in the, in the country. Yet there's this, still this perception uh, that Texas is somehow a mostly rural state or, or that the issues are the issues of the traditional uh, of issues of the traditional businesses such as ranching. Why does this perception exist and what's gonna, what, what do we need to do to, to change it and update that, that reputation of Texas? Uh, Henry, let's start with you. Well, Bill, first of all, thank you for inviting uh, me 
to be on this panel with Margaret, uh, who, for whom I have great respect and of course respect your work and thank you to the, um, the team that organized the Texas Blueprint. I suspect the reason why the, the legend and the image has, has lasted as durably as it has is because, you know, it, 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 people have created it, pushed it hard. Uh, it's been a great story and people know it around the world. So it has kind of some enduring uh, capacity. Um, it's interesting. I've heard the stories over the years of Texans who go abroad and when they're asked, where are you from? Meaning what country are you from? They answer Texas. And people in, in other parts of the world know it. They, it's not the United States. It's not the Midwest. It's not the West Coast. It's Texas. Even the, even the symbol of Texas on the map is recognized, the most recognizable state in the country. It's worn on belt buckles and everywhere, you know, football helmets and everything else. So I, I think we've just done a good job of articulating that legend of Texas as the land of wide open spaces and rugged people with true grit and uh, ranches and, and, and the novels like Giant and, and Oil Wells and stories about that. But the truth of the matter is uh, we have 25 metropolitan areas in Texas that comprise 85% of the population of our state. Only 15% of the population of Texas is rural. And uh, as the president of the university referred to, uh, we have three presently of the cities that are among the 10 most populous in America, Houston, number four, San Antonio, number seven, Dallas, number nine, and Austin in this census that's now being completed and compiled will be number 10. So four of the 10 most populous cities in America will be in, in Texas. Uh, it is clear that it, it's important to recognize that because it means different priorities for the legislature. It means different budget realities for the Texas government. Uh, it, 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 if, if we're going to, to sustain uh, the economic power of Texas, the truth of the matter is we have to recognize it's coming from our metropolitan areas in our cities largely now. And if we're not attentive to the issues they confront, transportation, education, housing questions, then we, we will have made a mess. So those are the reasons why I think we have to change it. And uh, it, it's, it's a, a conference like this is a good first step in kind of recognizing the reality of new Texas. Thank you, Henry. And thank you also for serving as the head of the steer, the chairman of the steering committee for this project. Um, Margaret, Secretary Spellings, thanks for joining us as well. Um, you are now the CEO of Texas 2036, which has laid out an ambitious agenda dealing with especially six different policy areas. I'm wondering if you could talk about the significance of urban and metropolitan Texas in, in grappling with the, in, in, as, as the locations for grappling with those issues that you at 2036 are dealing with. Uh, thank you, Bill. Before I do that, I want to congratulate you and uh, the University of, of Texas, the LBJ School, uh, and, and my friends at SMU at the Bush Presidential Center, and uh, thrilled always to be with my friend and colleague, Henry Cisneros. I, I think it's terrific that our, our great universities in our state are helping with practical policy advice that couldn't be more relevant uh, today than, than any other time. So thank you. Uh, and, and I guess I would say that, you know, our theory of action here is we have to think long-term about these issues and these most important uh, domains of education and infrastructure and health and the like. And our number one asset as a state, of course, is our people. Uh, we love our oil and gas industry. We love our uh, tech uh, leaders and, and the many things, the financial services sector, et cetera, et cetera. But the number one asset in our state is our people. And we have been a magnet for talent uh, from around the country and around the world. And we have done a much less good job of serving our own uh, homegrown uh, native population. And I like to say that healthy people are educated people, educated healthy people start businesses and have prosperous communities and families. And so that is the game. 
Um, before, I, I do want to recognize, though, that yes, there are 3 million uh, of our fellow Texans living in rural areas. They're important, too. That's more than 18 other state total populations. But the juggernaut of our economic prosperity and our future is our people that live in our cities. Secretary Spellings, what do you think is, the, when you look at the metropolitan, the urban and metropolitan part of Texas, what, what do you think are the most important driving issues that the state absolutely must address in order for, the, for that juggernaut to continue and for those metropolitan areas to thrive? Health and education. And you know, right now, our as I said a minute ago, our our outcomes, our data. Uh, we are all about the data at Texas 2036. You know, has some worrisome signs. Uh, we have these unbelievable assets. We're big. We're growing. We're diverse. We're well located. We have incredible universities that that spur innovation. We have all sorts of capital. But where we lag at the moment is fully development, de developing the people, especially those who live in cities. So they need access to broadband, they need better schools, and they need uh, better health care. And so we're working on all those things with the legislature. We're, listen, we're about to have uh, pretty significant infusions of federal dollars. It's a real catalytic moment for our state to make some of these investments. Um, and if and when we do, we will be poised to be not only the leader in the nation, but lead the world. And access to both health and, and, and education is an equally important issue in, in equal, on equal access in both rural Texas and also in many urban parts of Texas as well, in parts of Dallas, Houston, and so forth. Absolutely. And frankly, where we have lost ground on things like reading skills and the like, you know, most uh, certainly in the COVID era, the learning loss, uh, our disadvantaged students have, have experienced uh, more, more prominently. So we've got to be about it, get about it, developing our people, uh, and that will drive our prosperity in our cities and make great places to live and work. Mm -hmm. Be about it and get about it. That's what a great <laughs> phrase, Texas to create. Secretary Cisneros, from your perspective, um, uh, what do you think are the biggest, most important issues that, that must be addressed in order for the metropolitan areas of Texas, particularly in the Texas Triangle, uh, where all of the, where, where the where the three of us all operate, uh, uh, to for them to th continue to thrive in the future. Well, I think Mark is right. Education is right there at the top because uh, the modern American economy revolves around educated people, computer literate people, uh, the new industries that pull the Texas metro areas are things like new media and international trade and business services and uh, healthcare and biosciences and uh, higher education. And all of those are, require a higher level of attention to education than we've ever seen in our economic history as a state and as a country. And of course, uh, she mentioned health as well, and that, 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 that fits in. But the, but, the, but the overarching quality of life that includes education and health must also include transportation to fight the congestion that we otherwise will, will choke our cities. And, and usher in new forms of transportation in our metropolitan areas. Housing, which is proving to be a major problem in California, in Silicon Valley, it's driving people away because of housing prices. And then uh, all these issues related to the state's infrastructure, broader infrastructure. Climate change is a reality. And it means, as an example, rising sea levels that impact Houston and the ship channel uh, it's one of the most vulnerable places to rising sea level in the world. Uh, but it also means then drought conditions in West Texas and the in inadequacy of water, water supplies. We saw in the recent uh, cold snap across the state, the vulnerability of our electrical system, uh, which uh, paralyzed our urban areas at least for a few days. But the tail on that problem is long because people are gonna be paying for the costs that that generated for a long time. So all of these things are essential to creating the, the, the Texas future. Let me just say quickly as a historical point, because cities are, I mean, because a state is fast growth or prosperous at a time, doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way. I had an opportunity a few years ago to speak in Silicon Valley and I studied up for my presentation on kind of the, 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 the Achilles heel of Silicon Valley. 
And I looked at places like Massachusetts in the 1800s, which is the center of textiles and, and steel and armaments. In fact, many people believe the Civil War was won by the North because of the industrial capacity of places like that. But they didn't stay that way. Those were empty mill towns now in the Northeast. And then we had a period when the Great Lakes, Detroit, was the industrial center of the world. In fact, it was called the arsenal of democracy by President Roosevelt during the Second World War. We know what Detroit happened to Detroit. They went from 2 million people to 650,000 people. And Silicon Valley, I suggested in that speech, has to be careful. And here we are just a few years later, and we're reading stories in the New York Times business page about three weeks ago, describing the, the desperateness of people to get out of there at almost any cost because they can't sustain the costs. So even though we're enjoying a moment of prosperity, we have to be vigilant and aware of what it is that created that prosperity and how we sustain it, key word, sustain it by making the right kinds of investments, the right kind of adjustments, the right kind of priorities. Uh, and I think the, the list that Margaret mentioned and what I've added to it is what is necessary. Well, those are good points. As I like to say, I grew up in New York State and it fell apart. Then I moved to California and it fell apart. And now here I am in Texas, so watch out. Um, <laughs> but, How long are you planning to stay? Yeah. <laughs> um, Henry, Texas, you mentioned housing and affordability of housing. Texas has a reputation as a, and you're a, you have a long history in housing. Texas has a reputation as a relatively inexpensive housing market. And that's been one of our competitive advantages, particularly with, uh, in relation to, Cal in relation to California. What is the housing challenge that we face now and how can we address it? Well, like, like uh, every other major city in the country, our big cities, uh, our growing places are suffering an affordability crisis. Uh, a, a good portion of the, of the housing is not available uh, either entry level home ownership or affordable rentals. And I think Austin is a, you know, a classic case of what we're seeing there in terms of unaffordability to younger populations. So I would say the simple answer, and I'll keep it brief, is we have to produce affordable stock, affordable housing stock. It's a supply and demand problem. And we clearly have demand in migration to the state, keeping the young people who, who, who go to our great universities from other places as well as our own, but there needs to be a commensurate increase in the supply of affordable housing. And that means really intentionality, intentional actions to create affordable housing and to, and to deal with the attendant problems. And Margaret, I wanted to go back to the education question. Uh, the, uh, again, these questions are, for rural and urban Texas are similar but different. Uh, you mentioned how we are still importing workers rather than growing our own, which is maybe the biggest problem in the entire state. There's bipartisan support to, to address it. Um, what are the specific actions that you think are most important to deal with the urban side of that problem, with the, with the underserved neighborhoods and the urban school districts that struggle to educate these kids who are from all over the world and, and speak many different languages? Well, one of the topics you're going to cover later in this pa panel discussion, and that is ubiquitous, affordable broadband. I mean, people, I think, believe that there's lots of uh, capacity in urban Texas, but the truth of the matter is uh, many households are not connected because of a lack of affordability or an inability to know how to use it and to to be facile with technology. It is the gateway to learning, to telehealth, to e-commerce, we know that. Uh, we need to have our best teachers in our most challenging places, and we need to pay them for doing that very difficult and challenging and rewarding work. Uh, we need to make sure that, that our schools become centers for uh, services as they are, uh, and we've seen uh, for food services, for health services, as hubs of activity uh, so that we can address the needs of all people. And, you know, one of the key guiding principles, and frankly, one I feel really strongly about having represented school boards and, and worked around the state legislature, is we have to have what we at Texas 2036 call aligned accountability between the state and its own actors. 
school districts and counties and cities so that we're all pulling in the same direction as opposed to at odds with each other. When we do pull in the right same direction, we can close the achievement gap. We can make sure that we're resourcing uh, our, our issues and problems appropriately, but not if we're uh, going two separate ways. And I think frankly, we're seeing too much of that in our state today. And, and just to Bill, follow, if, if, yeah, Bill well, if I may, I want to pick up on a point that, 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 that uh, Margaret made, and forgive me if I have to, in order to make my point, slip over a little bit into the politics of the state today, but it's not only alignment with respect to education, that's critically important, but really alignment on this basic question that is the heart of this report, which is the way Texas is changing, and it is unquestionably urbanizing. That may be a bad word in some people's vocabularies, but it is a fact, a demonstrable, measurable fact that Texas is becoming more urban. We've cited the numbers already. Yet, in recent years, we've had a Speaker of the House who was caught on tape saying he was going to make it as miserable a session as possible for the cities. We have today measures in the legislature that would deny cities the right to lobby, to, to, to represent themselves. They cannot spend their budget to have a person in Austin, despite the fact the state has a representative in Washington. But whatever is going on, red, blue politics, urban, suburban politics, rural politics, whatever it is, it's bad for Texas. If we kill the, the, the goose that's laying the golden eggs, which is the international trade coming out of Houston and Dallas, the cybersecurity coming out of San Antonio, the technology coming out of Austin, the great universities providing talent in those states, uh, and all the other places from Corpus to Laredo to Brownsville to Midland to Amarillo to Lubbock to El Paso, all across the state that are that are relating to the global and to the to the to the national economy by creating urban places that work. It's a mistake for our state government, state leaders to pick fights with the cities because of politics. Uh, as usual, Secretary Cisneros inspirationally stated, um, uh, we're almost out of time. Secretary Spellings, last word. Well, I, again, uh, Henry put the, such a fine point on it. Um, it, it when we get our cities and the people in them uh, well served and uh, harness that human capital, our state will lead the world. And so we have, a, we have challenges, we have work to do, but the first thing we need to do and what you have, have done so well is elevate the, the importance of these issues and the doability of solving for these things so that we can continue to live in a great place to, uh, uh, to, to live and work. All right. Well, Secretary Cisneros, Secretary Spellings, uh, thank you very much for bringing a bipartisan approach to this question. We really appreciate both of your participation today. And at this point, I will turn it back over to our host, Stephen Pedigo from UT uh, Urban Lab, LBJ Urban Lab. Stephen. Great. Uh, Bill, thanks for that. Uh, very much appreciated. And what a wonderful conversation. Um, that you um, and both the secretaries provided us. I'm, I'm really excited about our next session, really to continue to advance the conversation by which we've talked about today. And that is sort of thinking about how we build a more inclusive Texas. As you uh, read our blueprint, you'll notice that one of the key guiding principles in, our pro uh, in this project was encouraging the investment in, in Texans um, and ensuring that all Texans can really participate as part of the economic prosperity of, of the state. Um, I am so pleased to be joined today uh, with three of our advisory panel members um, um, who participated in this project to talk about uh, building a more inclusive uh, Texas. First, let me introduce uh, my uh, esteemed friend and colleague um, and LBJ graduate, by the way, uh, Laura Huffman, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Austin um, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Laura, it's great to have you and thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, our second panelist is, is, is a, uh, a, a mayor, uh, Margo, uh, the former mayor of El Paso, who's done amazing work at advancing um, El Paso's economic prosperity and agenda and what's important for building uh, on the assets 
of international trade. And I'm looking forward to getting his perspective on that and why that is important to, to driving economic prosperity in our state. And finally, uh, Miguel Salas, who's the executive director uh, for the coalition uh, for, for New Dallas. Um, Miguel, it's great to see you. I love the art that you have in your office. Um, uh, it's a wonderful background. So Laura, let's start with you. Um, you took the reins of the Greater Austin Chamber at a really critical time. Uh, pandemic obviously had hit, this, um, had hit us all. We were grappling with the, uh, the challenges of racial equity and the calls for social justice. How has this last year really impacted how uh, the chamber has approached its economic development efforts here in Austin? Well, it, you know, last year was unusual in just about every way imaginable. And, and I'll just right off the bat, reinforce the comments that both Henry and Margaret made. It's all about talent. We hear over and over again for comp from companies that are looking at Austin that the number one competition they're in is to get the right talent. And so any time, energy and resources we spend on developing and continuing to grow that pipeline of talent, that local talent, that will serve us well in the future. Now, here, here's what Texas has going for it, right? And, and I live in a, a part of the state where people predicted that our region would come out of the pandemic first and, and strong. And, and that happened. And it's because there is, a, there is such a thing as economic resiliency, right? And, uh, and we are experiencing that and the benefits of that in our community. We've added whole new sectors in the last few years beyond high tech. Uh, with Tesla, we have automotive uh, manufacturing. Uh, with our partnership with the University of Texas, and a, an important point I do wanna make is that the partnerships that we have with higher education bear fruit uh, across a whole variety of fronts, but that led to a whole surge in life sciences uh, e economic sector in Austin. Uh, the location of the military in Austin has also created that military technology connection. So our economy has become more and more resilient. So key one is you got to have good talent. Uh, key two is you, you don't want to do just any old economic development. You want to do the kind of economic development that builds resiliency into your community that takes advantage of the natural assets that you have in your community. In our case, that has a lot to do with our relationships with higher ed and with the tech industry. And, and then I would be remiss if I didn't point out the things that didn't happen last year, right? So in some ways, I think a lot of American cities are facing the potential of a tale of two cities, the parts of communities that benefited. For example, last year was the strongest year we've had for economic development in the history of our economic development program. On the other hand, we saw tremendous job loss and, and probably those jobs are going away in the areas of tourism, uh, restaurants, live music, some of those things that we associate with the personality of Austin. And so, you know, I just wanna underscore and, and put an exclamation behind what Margaret said. Anything we do now to spend money differently, to come out of this differently, is money well spent. Those are the investments that we're responsible for thinking about. So when I think about availability of workforce I, and I think about those folks that lost their job, uh, it causes us to think about how can we provide real tangible programs and access to programs that do that upskilling, mm -hmm. uh, that, that put people that lost their jobs last year, those jobs aren't coming back in some cases, put them in a position to get those two-year degrees, those certifications, or even into a four-year degree program that mainstream them into the parts of the economy that are growing. And again, our junior colleges, our colleges, those are all critical partners in this. So Laura, what I'm hearing from you, it's not just about being able to attract those businesses to Austin. If we really want to ensure economic prosperity, it's about ensuring that we're also in bridging the gap between our workforce and that industry and making sure people have the opportunity to participate in those new industries. Is, is that a fair assessment? It's a completely fair assessment. And, and look, this is not even an area where people are disagreeing. Companies that are coming to Austin are either creating their own programs or are actively looking for partnerships with places like Workforce Solutions or community colleges. So this is just about making sure people find each other in the system. It, I'm not seeing any resistance to the idea that providing some you know, a suite of pathways from high school into the workforce is exactly where we need to be focused on. So Miguel, I kind of want to, I just want to move up the interstate I-35, hopefully not hit some traffic and go to Dallas. 
Um, oh, and, you're going to hit traffic, my friend. You're going to hit <laughs> yeah, lots right? of traffic. I'm sure. <laughs> um, you've been advocating for pathways in investment and education for your entire career. And, and much of the work um, that you all are doing at the Coalition for New Dallas is centered on that people-centric approach. Building off of what Laura suggested, and that is the connecting of industry to people, how is this playing out in Dallas and in the Metroplex in North Texas? Hey, you know, so really over the past 10 years in, in sort of the DFW area, there has been an evolving movement by, by what I term key eco dev institutions. I know we refer to them in the report as uh, you know, anchor institutions uh, to do things that establish a foundation for actually getting stuff done rather than uh, to continue to talk about and analyze the problem. And, and that started with just a simple reckoning with history and inequity in our cities and then coming together to, to sort of collectively engineer opportunity, um, especially for those who've gotten the short end of the stick generation after generation. And so what that spirit of rec reconciliation has actually manifested um, has been things like a movement towards universal pre-K. Uh, so that all students have a strong educational be beginning, um, establishing the foundation for universal broadband uh, to eliminate the digital divide, at the very least for our students who are in our public schools, uh, or, or doing things like creating the first comprehensive housing policy that we've ever had in, in the city of Dallas with a focus on affordability so that people can have a shot at generating equity so that they can move up the economic ladder. Um, so, so these things, I think, have been uh, examples of a way in which we have recognized that there is work, critical work to be done that we can no longer sort of analyze, sort of paralysis by analysis, and that we actually have to move on. Um, but that still doesn't change the fact about what's uh, the current state of Dallas. Um, Dallas is still a hyper-segregated city. Um, it's still one of the most unequal cities in the nation. And this pandemic sort of exposed all of that. In Dallas, and so while we have made significant ground in beginning to close uh, economic opportunity gaps, um, there's still a hell of a lot of work to do. And so policy is going to play a critical role, and support of these cities doing this work is going to be essentially important uh, for state leaders. Yeah, Miguel. I mean, when I think about workforce development, one of the things that that has obviously come to the forefront of my work, even as someone that thinks about economic development, is around that ecosystem. Right? It's around uh, thinking about how you put those. What I those wraparound services, those support structures are in place where people can actually access all of the great job opportunities and advancements and training um, that are necessary. You kind of have to, you know, provide the childcare, which is something that's important. Ensure that they've got the right technological uh, advancements, as as well as um, ensuring that they've got the right coaching and mentoring. And it sounds to me that those people-centric investments you're advocating are very, very important to ensuring that we're connecting the dots. They they absolutely are. I think it's also important to to state though that the institutions that are sort of the intermediaries between people's ideas and actual practice, sort of these anchor institutions, um, one of the things that has led to them, I think being more successful at trying to do uh, the work that we're talking about has been the fact that they finally started working together. They're beginning to de-silo their approaches to generating outcomes. And by that, they are then exponentially getting better at, uh, at producing results. It's one of the reasons why, if you look at a, a place like the Dallas Independent School District, we're starting to see significant improvement outpacing other large urban cities, outpacing the state and moving the needle for kids because we had institutions coming together, putting data at the forefront and research at the forefront, sprinkling a little bit of accountability into the mix uh, and, and we're seeing the, the needle move. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Margo, I wanna turn to you now and I'm gonna just turn our conversation a bit um, to talk about that, uh, the international border, the Texas-Mexico border. Um, you know, as mayor, you've long advocated that the border that, the, uh, that between Mexico and Texas is an economic development advantage. Um, and in fact, it's something, um, it's, it's under leveraged here in the state, perhaps. Um, you were quite insightful to our report in offering us insights and thoughts on investments that are necessary to advance that border uh, as, a, as a job creation tool, and particularly job creation for family supporting jobs. Can you offer us insights on how the state should be thinking about its relationship uh, and, and with international commerce, particularly that Texas-Mexico border as it plays out in El Paso? Sure, Stephen, thank you for the opportunity. Um, 
you know, we're the sixth largest, El Paso is the sixth largest city in the state of Texas, but we're still an unknown jewel. And people do not realize our historical involvement on this border is the largest U.S. city on the Mexican border. Our history actually dates back three, over 350 years to 1659. The uh, bulk of our population as one region was on the south side of the Rio Grande until 1848 when Fort Bliss was here. Uh, we, today, we say we're the, uh, the, the, the nexus of three states, Chihuahua, New Mexico, Texas, two countries, the United States and Mexico, and a regional population of 2.7 million people with an average age of 31. When we talk about values and human capital and education, I, I have stated on numerous occasions that I think we have more value in our human capital in this region, not just in El Paso, but in this region, than there is in the value of oil in the Permian Basin. That's what we're, we're dealing with. We're, we're, we're human capital. Um, we're, El Paso is 84% Hispanic. We are where the demographers in the state say Texas will be in the next 20 years. Yeah. Well, frankly, if you want to learn about what it's going to look like, you got to come to El Paso to see. Um, our cross-border trade with the Maquilas in Mexico and, and in Juarez is significant. We say for every four jobs in the Maquilas, the manufacturing operations there, of which there are, uh, I can't remember, something like 40 Fortune 1000 companies over there the manufacturing. Um, there are four jobs there. There's one job in El Paso. We have over 50,000 employees tied to the, uh, to the Maquilas. And then when we deal with uh, some of the challenge we have right now is frankly, uh, um, you know, we have immigration and we have pandemic. Um, as Yogi Berra said, uh, immigration, then what we're dealing with is uh, deja vu all over again. What we're dealing with today is exactly what I had to deal with in 2019, when the media dubbed us the immigration capital of the world. Um, it's, it's a real problem that's been there for 35 years, and it has an impact on commerce and the ability to go back and forth, because with the restrictions on the border, while we own the majority of the bridges between El Paso and Juarez, Mexico, uh, that the CBP controls ingress, egress, customs and border protection. And with the immigration crisis, they've been removed from the border. So we've had issues back in 2019 where it would take two hours to cross as a pedestrian, four hours to cross as a private passenger vehicle, and up to 11 hours for, uh, for um, uh, trucks and commerce. So that has a, a direct impact. And, and uh, sooner or later, Congress on both sides, both parties, both houses, has got to develop some intestinal fortitude in order to deal with immigration reform so we can get rid of this. But again, it's compounded with the, with, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, pandemic and what we've had to deal with with that. But uh, we see nothing but growth here uh, and, and resourcing from China coming to Mexico from a manufacturing, as we talk about, not only the political geo, geopolitical issues with with China that we're dealing with on a daily basis right now from an international standpoint, but also the uh, logistical areas and the uh, supply chains and the d delays that have been pointed out during the, uh, uh, this pandemic to have that operation in Mexico with its proximity and our, and our NAFTA reboot, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is, is a real viable future for, for Texas and, not, and, and our region. So, Mayor, what I'm hearing from you is that we have to think about efficiency around the border. We have to think about um, almost as, as how do we think about from an economic development perspective, making it as frictionless as possible where commerce can flow um, on both sides of the border. We've got time for just one more question, and it's a question I want to ask all three of you because it was at the center of what uh, we all recommended um, in our report, and that was collaboration collaboration between the public, the private sector to encourage local innovation. Laura, how do we get that done in Austin? Miguel, how do we do that in Dallas? And Mayor, how can we make that collaboration happen in, in uh, El Paso as well? And maybe Laura, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Um, I, you know, I, just, I think that's one of the things that's really shifted. There are, there are no real problems or opportunities that sit with any one sector. You know, 30 years ago, it might have been true that government, for example, could solve all the infrastructure problems that were needed as enabling conditions for economic development. That's not true anymore. 
Um, for one thing, we've discovered that daycare is part of infrastructure that people need to be uh, successful. And so for me, it's, it's about understanding the value that each partner brings to the table, not getting confused over roles and responsibilities and staying authentic. And, and, and those who have had a lot of power at the table in the past must yield some of that power in order to improve the authenticity of the collaboration. And so, you know, there is, there is a real need for some shared leadership and, and not everything is gonna be driven by the local government. Some things are gonna be driven by the business community. Some things are gonna be driven by the nonprofit community or the education community. And I, and I think that there, I actually have found that there's an increasing realization that any of the problems that used to be simple enough for one entity to solve by itself they're, they've come and gone. All that's left is the hard stuff. Yeah. And, and you simply cannot solve complex problems in isolation. That, that is, that's so true. The point of understanding value. I wish most of my um, city and partner clients would understand that because that's a really important point of view um, for sure. So thank you for that. Miguel, anything quickly to add and then we'll go, uh, we'll let the mayor have the last word here. Yeah, yeah, I agree a lot with what Laura just said. You know, I, I think that um, it's important to understand and I think we're, we're understanding this in Dallas that to have quality public-private partnerships, you've got to have quality public-private partnership infrastructure. And I think that, that there are three major components that make that, uh, that can establish that. The first one is research goals and metrics. You've got to be research goals and metrics driven to be able to move work forward and to be talking the same language and to know if you're doing the work. I think the second thing is true partnership when it comes uh, with accountability. So people coming to the table and then saying, I will do this and you can hold me accountable to my end of the bargain. And then the last thing is sort of the, the capital holy trinity. So it's the right data, it's the right people, and it's the right amount of money to move work forward. Um, and, and in Dallas, there are two great examples that I would point people to really quickly. Uh, Commit Partnership and the Child Poverty Action Lab, which in my opinion are lodestar collective impact infrastructures that are bringing all of these different partners in our community together to get aligned to and to move the needle. And they're holding each other accountable and doing it. And because of that, again, I would point to Dallas and say, we've got a great education system and it's continuing to improve. We've got a great transit system that's continuing to improve because we are doing the work together. That's great. Uh, Mayor, last comment, maybe word on this for us. Stephen, I agree with everything that Miguel and Laura have talked about. Uh, on the public-private partnership. I think we just need to move from a parochial environment. Uh, uh, I agree with what Secretary Cisnero said. Uh, the state legislature needs to allow the cities to dictate what's important for the cities. Some of the challenges in El Paso are totally different from Austin and Dallas. Uh, we have an inverted tax base. 70% of my property tax base is residential. We're the opposite. We can't do capital investments to the extent others can do. So we need support from the, uh, from the outside, the federal investments that need to be done. We need more staffing with the Customs and Border Patrol to our uh, bridges, that our bridges would be staffed federally so that we can have the commerce and ingress and, and back and forth. Uh, the educational system is continuing to need work on. Um, we, we, the economic viability of a community is solely predicated on the education of its workforce. Yep. And those are our kids and our future. And so you take all of that and where we are and, and understand the federal government needs to, to be a participant as a partner, not an obstructionist. The state government needs to do the same and we need to do it locally and where we're all working together. And I think that's what Margaret talked about at the beginning of her, her uh, discussion as well with the alignment of all of us together. So it is a true public private partnership that's got to be worked out on all levels without the parochialism that comes through political discourse. Yep. Well, great. Local civic innovation is the, uh, is I think a, a key takeaway of our discussion here, uh, both in our session and in the previous session. Um, Laura, Miguel, Mayor, thank you uh, for joining us uh, for today's discussion. I'll now turn the program over to Kyle Shelton, the Deputy Director of the Kinder Institute, uh, to lead us through a, a wonderful discussion about um, affordable housing. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everybody else. Oh, all three of my housing panelists just jumped on. Good. They didn't even need the prompt. Thank you, everybody. Um, really excited to be here with everyone this morning. Thanks for joining us. And I'm excited for this part of the conversation as well. Um, I want to introduce the folks joining us this morning. Dr. Miriam Agouf is the Vice President uh, for Policy Development and Research at the Dallas Housing Authority. 
Leela Powell is the executive director for the San Antonio office of the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. And Jack Matthews is the president of Matthews Southwest, a major real estate developer um, active in the Dallas area. And we're really glad all three of you could join us today and that all three of you were able to join us for our in-depth working group discussion around housing and, and thinking about this blueprint project. Um, Jack, I, I want to jump right in and ask you a question uh, and then on all of these, open it up to all three of you as we go through. But um, our report really talks about the importance of ensuring that uh, affordable housing is not just a, a publicly subsidized project, but also relies on market in, uh, intervention and market housing as a major part of the solution that they, those are going to have to be um, done in tandem in order to address, as the first panel discussed, our, our growing issues around affordable housing. In your mind, Jack, and in the work you all do, what are some of the ways that local governments uh, and the state government could work to make investments or change existing land use rules to open that door wider for market rate housing to help fill the affordable housing gap we're seeing? Okay, so there's lots of, uh, I guess the end answer is pretty easy. It's the politics of getting to the end answer. So I, I always try to figure out why things don't happen and then figure out why they don't happen. How can you get through that? So right now the, you know, the politics of a city um, is that gentrification is great for the, uh, for the tax side of it and terrible for the people who are negatively affected. Um, from the state government standpoint, you know, gentrification is something that in their minds generally, I'm saying generally, makes life easier. So it's, um, you know, it's less poverty that they see in that area. So, but really when you get down into it, the, the negative effects the people you're affecting are, are huge and, Ignoring that is, is not not what we should be doing uh, because that that all it's hard to get an educated healthy person if they don't have a house. Um, it's really so I'll I'll just say on the on the market side of of things, the the state and the cities have to understand when they put a dollar into something, what are the positive effects and the negative effects of putting that dollar in. And I find many times you get a mantra of, we want affordable housing. We're gonna put 400 units here, um, but not the effect. So what um, Miguel was talking about is how those things come together with the information and the, that, that's critical. However, you need, you need to have the direction and the understanding of what you want. So right now I have to give Dallas some credit um, in the city of Houston also in trying to understand what they want. So there's a thousand unit challenge going on right now. And basically you have a competitive um, deal that puts a bunch of city assets um, into a pile and says to developers, how can you best do this? But behind that, you have to have the right political thinking in the sense of what's the right thing to do. And it's... Um, so when you, when you ask a really simple question, what can they do? It, it starts with understanding and then it goes to resources, but we all know resources are limited. And so it's critical that you spend those resources properly. So Kyle, I've probably spent uh, too much time in your limited amount of time, but that's... No, that's great. And I think that's a, a really nice uh, reinforcement, I think, of what Miguel said earlier, right? Like knowing what outcomes you want, especially from the public sector side and, and framing that for market developers is really critical here. Leela or Miriam, any additional thoughts on sort of uh, that, that role of how market rate can plug in to either augment or build alongside um, subsidized, publicly subsidized housing? Sure. Um, on the public housing authorities perspective, I think it's important to understand the direction that is taken um, in the industry. And one target that we have is to kind of move away from uh, the 100% subsidized housing units development. And so it's absolutely critical um, that we align um, our efforts and investment with those of the private sector. And so being able to develop both subsidized affordable housing units in conjunction with market rate is likely to enhance the quality of life and the trajectory of the families that we serve us from a governmental perspective. And so I'm very familiar with the work of Mr. Matthews. He's one of our cherished developers at the Dallas Housing Authority. So that would be one of the additional point that I would make. 
it's really opening up that opportunity to have mixed income. Absolutely. Products. Critical. Yeah. Well, I'd love to look at this from a slightly different angle and, and do a call back to some of the earlier uh, comments about uh, meeting people where they are. And also, I think, address some of the concerns I've seen in the chat and the Q&A about how we undertake any type of a coordinated public action in such a polarized atmosphere that we experience right now. And for all of us on the housing side, I think we know what NIMBY stands for, the not in my backyard syndrome. Um, the same folks who are very loudly demanding that we do something about homeless encampments, for example, are not particularly keen on having uh, a project uh, in their neighborhood um, that, um, that uh, reaches those uh, particular clients. So one of the things that we've tried to do at LISC is in San Antonio is look for solutions that may not even be uh, categorized at always as affordable housing, but that meet the various needs of different sectors of the community. So, and I'll just use an example. I think there are others like community land trusts that are organizing uh, 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 programs around how communities can uh, sort of self-determine their future. But I wanna mention something uh, that we've been working on here, which is emphasizing the need for accessory dwelling units and why an accessory dwelling unit strategy is not inherently necessarily about affordable housing. And it's not, uh, it, it's about meeting the needs of various families in our community. If you have an older relative who wants to, who needs to age in place, if you have a, a family member who needs additional uh, mental or physical health care, if you'd like to build assets and you'd like to have a unit uh, where you're getting uh, uh, income from that. Um, if, uh, if we, have a narrative around housing as a human need and how giving people flexibility to meet that need um, uh, can, can meld into neighborhoods in a more seamless way. Almost no one wants 100 units of housing next to their home, but almost everyone can think of a family member or a friend who has needed support at one time or another or a place to stay. So we need to stop answering the question uh, that we're asking, how do we produce at scale and start thinking about how we meet individuals and families where their needs are. And interestingly enough, what we do at that point is we're then building these partnerships we're talking about, not just with advocacy groups um, who may be uh, searching for uh, strategies like AARP for aging in place, not just with, um, with neighborhood groups, but also with the, the individuals who, who need solutions here. Um, and then there are cross, those are cross-sector answers as well. So densifying neighborhoods leads to better transportation outcomes. It leads to more buying power. It leads to individuals who are already, uh, who are homeowners, but may be burdened uh, with uh, additional taxes to have extra income. So I, I think while tax credit uh, in, uh, projects and, and uh, are important and will continue to be important, we have to broaden the way we think about meeting housing needs uh, in order to uh, truly create the kind of cross-sector partnerships that we need. Thanks, Ella. I think that's really important. And that flag about the reality of our housing challenges, it's easy to fall sort of into that uh, view of, well, we're talking about folks at 30% of median income or 60% of median income, and they're pressing and incredible challenges for finding safe and affordable homes for those folks. Absolutely. And that's really where the crunch is the worst. But one of the things we've talked about today and that we've seen in our research and others across the state have seen is that it's increasingly harder for people from all walks of life and all stations of life to buy homes, find affordable rents. And so that idea of talking, we're talking about affordable housing writ large, right? And it's, there's, there's an affordable element for everybody. Um, and, and that question of what does it look like for a retired grandparent or what does it look like for a single person working and trying to find a home next to their job, I think is really important. Um, I'm wondering if we can dig a little bit more into this partnership and kind of collaboration question. A few of you have spoken about some examples already, but I'm wondering from your all's perspective and, and if you have some specific examples of whether, whether finding more ways to partner between nonprofit and for-profit groups, working with public agencies like the housing authorities, Miriam, um, or even just cities and counties, what are, what are some examples of, of really fruitful places you think we could continue to do more work here? Uh, in the state, and maybe Miriam, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. So, um, from the public housing perspective, you know, our public housing stock is aging, our budget is shrinking, and so there is a pressing for us to be able to reinvest in redeveloping our units. And so, public private partnerships are a huge target for us again uh, to be able to leverage that tax exemption 
for us to be able to meet, um, I guess, the, the demand of the market to make it happen. So that's one um, venue that we're taking to leverage partnership to meet some of our housing need. Another one is much more by design is around the voucher program that we operate, which of course would not work without the partnership of landlord um, of landlords. We've been working recently for the past two years with AAGD, uh, the Association of Greater Dallas, to be able to better understand what are some of the pain points that may deter the participation of landlords that we could be addressing as housing authorities, uh, notably in terms of you know just operational procedures and innovation. So that's another way where partnership across the public and the private sectors um, come um, to importance. The other one is the one that I focus a lot in my work. I, I really feel that as a housing authority, you know, the provision of housing of a housing subsidy is not the solution to the housing crisis, right? Because of the level of vulnerability of the families that we serve. And so one thing that we want to focus on is to partner with other folks in other sectors, educational, childcare, transportation. And I think that as Miguel has talked about, there is a somewhat of a consensus growing up in Dallas that we have to align resources because of the shared mission that we have. However, as a practitioner now that I have left academia, I think one of the real difficulty is to operationalize and sustain that partnership. And so we have real obstacles. I think some are political, others are really logistical and operational. So it's very difficult to share data. It's very difficult to invest in innovation, in, in tech infrastructure to sustain the partnership for it to work. Um, and so again, I think there are some low hanging fruit that works well in terms of growing the actual housing stock and enhancing what we have, but to also be able to enhance uh, some of our natural housing investment, like housing subsidy, we have to work with other folks in other sectors. But I think, again, we have to deploy the necessary resources and innovation to to sustain it and to make it happen beyond the quarterly meeting or the monthly meeting that we have, or just beyond the mere planning document that are being produced on a yearly basis. I had to laugh when you said that data sharing is not easy. I believe I have five it's, open it's data negotiations <laughs> going on right now. So I know that pain for sure. Uh, Leela or Jack, do you guys have other thoughts on the uh, ways to more innovatively partner or effectively partner beyond what you've already shared? I, I'd be happy to get into an area that I think needs more attention. And that's the, the, the cheapest house to bring back is one where there's already a lot or already an existing house that needs to be fixed up. And I don't know if you look at a number of, of parts of the city, um, there is not a lot of attention or dollars being spent there. Um, there is a house bill out right now, 1577, um, that basically it addresses the negative effects of gentrification and brings back uh, dollars to the city and school board, but really protects that. As I say, the, the lady who works two jobs, has three kids and mm -hmm. doesn't have any political connection. Um, so we, we've got to take care of one to the other and you have to make the economics right so people will spend time and money to, to get these things done. So I, I say we have to spend time there. The, but the political will and the understanding, um, because you know people, people fight good, wanting great, and sometimes that causes nothing to happen. Well, I'd like to add, uh, just building on these comments that, and and maybe uh, foreshadowing the transportation discussion a little bit, um, the public sector creates value by the investments that we make. And having worked for city and county government, I'll say we, even though I'm in a nonprofit setting right now, but um, uh, 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 public infrastructure investments and even programmatic investments in in parks, in roads, um, in uh, community centers create value and make neighborhoods more valuable. And in the best cases, everyone in the in the neighborhood benefits from that. In the worst cases, if we've seen in rapidly gentrifying communities, longtime residents are priced out of their communities either through taxes or rent increases in areas where the the best intent was to create a better quality of life for everyone. So I. Think I think some of the planning and some of the collaboration happens not in project implementation, but happens way before we put any uh, type of uh, uh, um, a project or program uh, uh, out, you know, for, for public review and consideration. You know, there was a, um, 
a, a great example in Phoenix as Phoenix developed their light rail system and set aside a lot of space for a lot of uh, open space for parking. As the system developed and built out, those surface parking lots were no longer needed, but they functioned as a land bank to allow uh, a more intensive development along the right light rail line. So the level of thinking that we're needing is many years in the future when those infrastructure investments uh, have, have uh, fully developed and we have set aside the, uh, the, the spaces and uh, the, the programmatic work to allow everyone to be included in those benefits, not to let the market come in and exclusively determine uh, who will have enough resources to stay in, in that area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm struck that really, I think resonates across all of the discussions of today is really recognizing the inter knittedness of all of this mm -hmm. and sort of the interdependencies that each of these discussions have with one another and the, you know, the levers you pull over here really do on economic development really can affect housing and with a topic like housing, it's easy to kind of get lost in a lot, right, or in a project and sort of forget the, the context of all of that. And I think that's really critical to talk on more. Um, a, another big theme that we talk about uh, in the report, and again, encourage everybody to go through the whole body of the document, which we've shared with you all, it's really rich. Um, but one, the, the sort of last question I wanna ask with you all today is we talked a lot about how the state can work to enable, to allow cities to innovate more and to be, to take more approaches that are locally funded and, and sort of drawn on innovation and ideas from, from the city and metro area. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have ideas and, and, and what you would see as some of the biggest opportunities for the state to either open more pathways or to consider supporting more innovative housing approaches uh, across public subsidize and, and market rates. What are, what are some ideas you all have? Leela, I saw you unmute yourself. You want to start? I want to jump in because I, I want to ha um, highlight an example that you call out in the report around PSH or permanent supportive housing um, and restricting how localities utilize permanent supportive housing as a solution to lots of pressing challenges like the lack of mental health care services uh, and, and the overwhelming challenge of homelessness in some areas. Restricting PSH, restricting what localities can do with PSH is the opposite of what the state needs to be doing. We, we, I fully support and, and, and the folks I work with fully support um, utilizing that tool uh, aggressively so that people who have experienced homelessness can get the supportive services they need. Uh, and um, I, I think that the, the state can start by not tying the hands of localities uh, when it comes to innovative provision of housing. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, I'd have to second, second that remark in a number of ways. I would concur with Leila's point. I think it's one starting point that would be very useful for municipalities is to start to do an inventory of what works and what doesn't work and what are some of the state level parameters that are inhibiting um, the innovation on the ground at the local level. Um, and I think having a more practical understanding of, of this idea that we're, we're discussing, right, that some state level restriction or inhibiting solution at the local level will, I think, help the shift in, in legislation. Um, I think there is a common understanding around it, but I think doing an inventory uh, in, ways within, in ways in which um, the relaxation of, of this uh, requirement could actually help at the local level could be really fruitful for a change uh, in the legislation. But the, the report that's that's been produced that I, I have to commend everyone who worked on it, um, it's got to be used in a hard fashion. It's got to be put out of here. Here is very intelligent people putting ideas forward that your policy should follow. Because there, there's a certain mantra when you get into Austin that is against certain things that are not fully understood. And so the, the data backs what you're saying, and it, but it's got to be driven hard. So um, anyway, that's, I, I loved what I read. I'm um, I'm cautious that it's not used hard enough. Thanks, Jack. Just yeah. continuing in the tradition of, uh, of of piling on California here <laughs> that was started earlier in the in the call. Uh, you know, uh, currently California is zoned for fewer units of housing in many cities than it was 50 years ago. That the the use of zoning um, as a, a tool to keep 
uh, uh, lower resource individuals out of a community. Uh, and I, I know that many people perceive that as an overreach in local control, but I think if we look at truly empowering residents in, uh, in neighborhoods to engage in land use planning and to propose innovative solutions where they're increasing density. Someone mentioned co-housing um, so that you may have a structure right now that has one or two people in it and, and, and maybe it's eight or 10 people that we need living in the size of, of, of the housing unit we have. We have seen the average square foot per person in the United States over the past 50 years go from about 300 uh, uh, feet per person to almost 800 feet per person. That is a huge expansion in what we consider to be an acceptable uh, standard of living. And it discriminates against folks who don't have the resources to buy that level of housing for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, uh, I wish we could keep going, but I'm gonna wrap us up here and I'm gonna say, you know, I think it's very, it's very clear that this, there are multiple levers, as I was er saying earlier, that we need to be thinking about pulling here and thinking also about uh, how do you evaluate and direct the outcomes that come from that and really understand whether we're not, whether or not we're moving the needle and helping address this challenge. So Leela, Jack, and Miriam, thank you guys so much for joining and again for all your inputs. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Colm Clark, who's the director of the Bush Institute at SMU's Economic Growth Initiative to wrap us up with our last panel today. Take it away, Colm. Thank you very much, Kyle. Well, our final panel today is going to address the challenge of bridging the digital divide in Texas. This is something that's come up several times in our conversations today. It's also something that Governor Abbott has named as one of his top priorities for the current legislative session. We're, we jo we're joined today by a couple experts uh, who have been deeply involved in this issue for a number of years. Um, Amanda Edwards, to start with, is a former at-large Houston City Council member. She's the founder of Be The Solution, a community empowerment organization, and she serves as president and CEO of the community-based solutions firm. Um, Jennifer Sanders is the executive director and co-founder of the Dallas Innovation Alliance, a nonprofit founded in 2015 to support the city of Dallas's smart city strategy. For the past three years, the Dallas Innovation Alliance has been deeply focused on developing solutions to bridge the digital divide. Thank you so much for joining us today. So let's start by getting clear on the scale of the problem. For the United States as a whole, broadband now estimates that at least 15% of households don't have a functioning broadband connection. It may be significantly more. In Texas, up to 30% of school-age children haven't had good digital connectivity at home and therefore have suffered very significant challenges accessing school over the last year. And it's not just a rural problem. At least 15% of households, even in our state's six largest urban counties, don't have a broadband connection. Uh, Council, Councilwoman Edwards, let's start with you. Why does this issue matter to the economic future of our state and its people? Thank you so much for bringing up such an important topic and bridging the digital divide is something that not only is important for today, but it's also about providing access to opportunity for the future. And when we think about 30% of our students not having access to broadband connectivity, and we think about that in the COVID context, certainly it becomes something that can be jarring for people to think about. But this has been an issue that extended well before uh, COVID. It's just that we've now brought some attention to it and some and renewed focus on it. What you do when you don't have when you have students and parents who don't have access to internet, you're cutting them off from opportunity to school, education, but then also jobs. Think about how many applications are online and how people search for jobs, post jobs. And so we're really creating a conundrum from ourselves in terms of a vacuum for economy, but then also investment in education. One of the things that's paramount for us to think about is how do we reduce those barriers? We need to think about infrastructure relating to uh, broadband connection for example, as we do with roadways, as we do with activity and infrastructure, electricity even, and that this is a vital key piece uh, of providing people with access to opportun opportunity for a quality, affordable, I mean, quality, uh, quality life that they need to be able to access. And so that translates across the broad spectrum, and we need to focus on that now. 
Jennifer, your, your thoughts on the importance of bridging, bridging the digital divide? No, um, thank you all for having me. I'm honored to be here. And I would just echo you know, everything that, that was said and those incredible insights. I would say that as it relates to economic development, you know, this is really a high level economic development perspective from a company relocation and building perspective, municipal efficiency and service delivery. And then obviously at the individual resident and student level, a lot, um, the majority of companies look at having this infrastructure existing as one of the major factors that's increasingly part of the score sheet. And because so many of the businesses now really require heavy digital infrastructure, data centers and beyond. So when we look at that as, a, as bringing jobs in, that's a huge component. Cities are, as it become increasingly digital, as the expectations of residents become uh, more instant gratification, become they want it simple, that's a piece. And then as has been stated, if we want to train and elevate the next workforce, you know, and I think we're gonna talk about later the literacy component, you know, we, we have to make sure that that access um, is provided. And I think the pandemic provides obviously a great opportunity when things are thrust into the spotlight like this, a true understanding of the scale of this problem comes to play. So, um, so experts, and I think you pointed to some of this just now, uh, Jennifer, experts uh, have pointed out that there are at least three overlapping barriers to digital access for many Texans. One is the physical infrastructure as such. Second is the ability to pay for a broadband account. And the third is digital literacy. Are people prepared to, to use all the technologies well, even if they do have the account? So Jennifer, why don't you go first and help us to understand how these three barriers are playing out in our state and, and with particular reference to our cities, because I think oftentimes people think this is a rural problem and I, our report is really trying to call attention to the fact that it's not just a rural problem. 100%. And, you know, we talk about those three legs of the stool and without one of them, it cannot stand. And this is not a, it's not a field of dream situation where if you build it, people will use it if they can't afford it, if they don't know how to access it and how to use it. And, and really in a lot of cases, in a lot of communities, if they don't understand the value of internet and how it's going to impact their lives, it makes uh, making that a priority even more of a challenge. And so I think um, in urban areas, the access or the infrastructure itself is probably the least of the three. It may not be coming into homes, but the presence of these fiber spines means that that is an expensive, but a bit of an easier lift. Um, the affordability is, is a huge challenge for a lot of these communities. And these you know, subsidy programs and government programs are an enormous help to that, but, but they're not going to last forever. And so when we look at the literacy piece, I think that's the most challenging. And if you invest in the literacy, both from a how do I turn on my computer? We're doing some programs right now where that is part of the beginning of the training. It's really step zero. You elevate the existing workforce. And then in the future, obviously looking at our students being competitive, which creates higher wages, which creates the affordability piece you know, within a generation for sure to be less of a barrier and you eliminate that through the training piece. So Councilwoman Edwards, let's let's go to you. So it's more than an infrastructure problem, as Jennifer has just said. It's clearly more complex than that when we talk about digital literacy, ability to pay and so forth. Could you give us your perspective on these barriers and, and what's it gonna take to overcome them? Yes, I think that's right. It is more than an infrastructure uh, barrier, but I will highlight that internet deserts also are prevalent in cities. They're just difficult to track because of the fact that all of that infrastructure is not necessarily public. So it's not like a public roadway where you can see uh, and, and the right of way is visible or, or apparent. And so it's a little bit harder to track. They're certainly in, in my hometown of Houston, which is the fourth largest United States, there are plenty of internet deserts and the challenges until you get an anecdotal piece of information about, oh, we just don't have anything in this particular area, um, then you don't happen to necessarily know all of the details around that. I think to the point of uh, connectivity barriers in terms of access to cost, I mean, having free or low cost internet service that is high quality is, I think, the realm gets us into the realm of how do we equitably uh, provide opportunity for people to excel in their education as well as to excel with regard to economic opportunity. If we do not focus on low 
or free internet access than a, a, of high quality because sometimes you hear about programs like that, but if it takes you half of the class to log in because your internet is so so slow, it may not do you the service that you, you're you seeking to, to have it benefit you for. So in this instance, I, I think we've got to kind of figure out what is the best approach to that. But I think we've got to be looking to uh, grant funding from the federal government, the state government, as well as local and public private partnerships as well. We recently in the city of Houston uh, have gotten some increase in the uh, free uh, internet access at certain locations. And so oftentimes when you do see municipalities arrange deals or get some type of incentive offered, uh, it's, it's a finite number of areas rather than the entirety of that jurisdiction. But in truth, that's what we're, that's the direction where we're headed. Um, we're seeing it on buses. We're seeing it in places of transport and we've got to just see internet access everywhere at free or low cost. And more for those that can't afford it, have it subsidized. You all have both. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. If, if I could jump in just for a minute on the data piece that that's that's referenced, it's the way that we're able to map infrastructure across public private education that already exists. There are such gaps and it. it can be so it can be extraordinarily difficult to diagnose where the highest need is in terms of focusing mm -hmm. investments and where should we be building? Where should public entities be putting in infrastructure to fill gaps that are make sense? Subscription rates are another data set that is enormously helpful, which helps with the affordability piece. If we know the infrastructure's there and subscription rates are negligible, then we know how to diagnose better. And right now there's there has to be, you know, a bit of leap of faith, which doesn't always allow for the wisest, you know, heavy infrastructure investment. So that data piece is critical in how do we have better comprehensive access to all the pieces that we need. So that that to me is a is a major element of where perhaps policy can support. So during the COVID year, it, 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 at least from the Dallas perspective, Jennifer, that you and I have been uh, living, uh, it does seem that there have been a, a number of efforts by uh, school systems that in, in some cases I would call downright heroic, as far as I can tell, to connect kids to remote school. Uh, a lot has happened in a hurry. But there's obviously so much more to do. Could you, uh, Jennifer, why don't you why don't you carry on here a little bit and talk about uh, what local governments in the states, metro areas, and other public public authorities, school districts, but not only school districts, it could be housing authorities, whatever it is. What are local governments and authorities doing right now that you think everyone else needs to hear about, and and what should they do? Well, I, I think to your point, there have been heroic efforts. I I don't think. In the, in the years that I've been involved in this space, I don't think I've ever seen initiatives move as quickly through, let's designate, let's diagnose, let's look at interlocal agreements and contracting in such a compressed time span. And, and that's incredible. And, and would, would love for that to become something that could continue um, through easing you know, some of the collaboration but at the local level, how do we invest in innovation? So that, that goes back to the previous conversation, but in Dallas specifically, what we've seen is a tremendous collaborative effort around Operation Connectivity, which is broadly 17 school districts in the region and cities. But in Dallas, what they've done is, you know, the Dallas School District looked at the hotspot and device uh, connectivity pro problem. In April of 2020, they identified 75,000 students within the district, which is about 40% did not have in-home access. So immediately looked to tackle that. Um, the city of Dallas concurrently had been working on extension of public Wi-Fi networks in highly targeted areas. And, um, and some other entities and what they were able to do through working together is look at complementary pockets. Let's not build and address the exact same neighborhoods, but let's look how we can knit together networks that are created to really solve tr problems in these top 10 zip codes. And so the interlocal agreements that that involved, the permitting, you know, easements, and then cost sharing in some cases um, within I think six months end to end and standing up the first network that the district built freestanding is just incredible to me. So I think there's not going to be a single solution that works for everywhere. I think we all know that, but I think the ability to take a, you know, to really take a thoughtful strategic approach and zoom out and say, how do we knit together what we have and what we're trying to build to be most efficient, effective um, with funds and with, and with time, you know, staff time. I've never heard a city say I have too much money and too many people. 
And so the more that we can, we can leverage each other um, in bandwidth, literally and figuratively is, is gonna be critical. But I think those multi-sector, multi-industry partnerships in Dallas is really a testament to what can be done quickly and well moving forward. Thank you, Councilwoman Edwards. Uh, how about uh, from your point of view in Houston or anywhere in the state, are you seeing some local initiatives that have really, that you think all the rest of us should be paying attention to and learning something from? Yeah, so I mentioned one in Houston just recently, uh, and actually just a few weeks ago got um, uh, inked, which was to connect some of the park space, multi-service center spaces, uh, so that people have places to go with regard to um, being able to access the internet. Now, as I listened to Jennifer talk about the work that has been done and a uh, tremendous job that's been done in, in the Dallas area, it did occur to me that you know, if we re-envision the way that we think about internet, it should not necessarily cons be considered a privilege in terms of what people can access. And so the hoops that had to be jumped through in order to cobble together all of the public-private partnerships, seems like if we re-envision the way we think about this as, a, as an asset and something that's a necessity, um, then we should have much more streamlined approach eventually if everybody embraced that view. Um, we've had to work in uh, within a system, I think, that thinks of internet as a luxury, but in a modern society, it is not a luxury. It is a requirement, it is a necessity in order to be successful. And so we have to treat it as such. It's like thinking about water and electricity. No one asks, you know, treats that in our country as, as a luxury good. Uh, we just know that for certain standards and quality of life, you have to have certain things. So I'd love to see us get away from having to be so creative. I'm, I commend the creativity because that's the system in which we exist now, but I would love for us to be able to have a much more streamlined approach to providing internet connectivity in an equitable way so that those that are under-resourced aren't for, further left behind. And so I hope with regard to the federal government, we begin to see more grant funding, much larger amounts. I'd hope the same holds true on the state level. I know that the governor has indicated that it's a priority for this particular session. Uh, and then I hope the same holds true with regard to the private sector. It's gonna be a public-private partnership because they're private providers of these services, but. There are also uh, services that I, I view to be necessity items. And so we've got to view, view them differently and begin to uh, prioritize how they get delivered differently as well. So just then, to, I, we're running, running low in time, but I want to do a high speed round. One last question, just uh, uh, in a handful of words. Perhaps there's some significant federal money coming in, perhaps in an infrastructure bill. The state legislature is meeting right now. If the state of Texas could do one thing to advance on this issue this year, what would you, what would it be? Jennifer, you first. Oh my gosh, a couple sentences. I, I think it would <laughs> I, I think it would be empowering and and really perhaps mandating that that money goes toward the building of the infrastructure, but the training and the empowering local communities to be part of that solution. And so I think if you can fund local CBOs to spread and be able to elevate the training quickly and also opening up and easing uh, the process for these interlocal, interjurisdiction, public-private partnerships, however we can make that work. And I would like an enterprise fund at the state level that's focused on digital infrastructure and connectivity. Councilwoman Edwards, you have the last word. Yes, much like we had to take an a different kind of approach to looking at our food deserts, looking at our internet deserts the same way and bringing in the private partner, seeing what they can do uh, to make this more accessible, making sure the infrastructure is there and taking a really comprehensive multifaceted approach and in, in areas where it's most needed. And so that will include rural communities, that will include some suburban communities and will include uh, urban communities. And when we say where it's also most needed, if it's not an infrastructure challenge, uh, then providing the necessary subsidies so that these kids can get educated too and that their parents can have access to jobs as well and, and that nobody be left behind with regard to having access to internet connectivity. Thank you. Well, we are out of time. I'm going to turn things over to Stephen in just a moment to close, but I do want to say one thing um, uh, about this whole event. So, First of all, thank you, Amanda Edwards, Jennifer Sanders. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, speaking from the Dallas part of the state, I'd just like to say on behalf of the George W. Bush Institute, SMU, 
economic growth initiative, that it's been really exciting to collaborate with the colleagues you've heard from today, from uh, from Rice, from UT Austin, uh, and this much broader group of experts that we brought together from all over the state, trying to address the challenges shared by metropolitan areas throughout our giant state. Uh, and it's very much our hope to build on this going forward. And it's also our hope that all of our institutions can be part of a sort of an effort to build a broader convoy of well-aligned institutions in Texas, all working to address the metropolitan challenges that our increasingly metropolitan uh, state faces. So any rate, enough for me. Stephen, you're up. Well, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and if you are looking for more content about the report, you can find the report on our websites, um, both at the Kinder Institute for Rice, the SMU Growth Initiative, and the LBJ School as well. And also you can uh, find uh, the content in bite-sized forms on our social media network. So, so thank you all. We look forward to your feedback and comments and um, thanks for joining us for today.